Welcome to the High Performance Podcast, which is a chat where we delve into the minds of athletes, entrepreneurs and visionaries. Sean, lovely to have you with us. Thank you. So, shaping a club in your own image, does that ring true when we talk about what you've done here in the years? Yeah, it could be. Um, With me, suave, sophisticated. um, (laughs) All those things. (laughs) Yeah, sort of Rob Lowe looking back in the heyday. Um, Maybe Tom Cruise in there as well, but... No, I think, you know, the, the reality is um, uh, some of the values, I think, possibly. Um, I don't think uh, literally everything's about, about me. I've had to head it up like managers do. And I think the longer you're into a club, then you rub off on what's around you more and more. Um, but I think it's a collective attitude, or I think it is. I have to lead that. But I'd like to think the staff, the players, um, people at the club buy into some of the key core values that we've laid down. And once they were laid down, we've built around them. So what are those key core values? If I say to you, a Sean Dyche team, and and this is really so that, you know, people at home that don't even work in football are not involved in elite level sport. I want them to sort of get takeaways for their own world. So what are the things that you believe make a successful organisation, whether that is football, finance? Well, I've gone back on, on record many times and said, you know, it started for me as a young kid when the first club I ever played for, Eyes Lodge Football Club, little you know Sunday league club the coach there even, I'm not saying he's an amazing coach but he's had a great attitude everything and it just stuck with me all my life so that's not a bad start if you've got people around you have got a great attitude towards whatever it is whatever goal you intend to try and achieve if they've got a great attitude towards it that's a great start for me coming into Burnley the first thing was to get a, a feel of the area I'd been up here many times many different teams I know that the town is dominated by the football club and the, and the, the people of the town back the football club so I knew that already. So really, I thought, well, what, what, what would they want to see? Well, the first thing you want to see, in my opinion, is a team that gives everything. So the first thing we said, my first ever interview, I said, I can't promise you'll win you know, or lose. I can't promise you major success. What I can promise you, you'll have a team that will give everything. There will be sweat on the shirt. And I meant every word of it. I think, you know, from a fan point of view, we know it's changed now. We'll, I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, brand and, and you know, styles and the culture of, of football has changed. But... A modern fan even would still want, I think, to see a player give their lot, give everything they can. So I thought, well, that's a good start. So a lot of the simplicity of it that came off the back of that. And then if you're talking about that, before you worry about 4-4-2 and 4-3-3, you're then going into the world of mindset. And if you go into mindset, well, what are the key core values that you want that mind to be set on? Well, hard work, passion, pride, um, enthusiasm. Um, you know, a, a joint, a, an agreed work ethic, an agreed application to the task, and all these things start kicking in. And we we were looking to put that in way before we worried about four four two and four three three, because we felt that was the, the the bedrock to build not just a team, but to build on beyond a team and build build it into the club, if you like. So. I guess I take some lead on that, you know, of course, and some uh, good news from that, if you like, when people say well, it's a Sean Dyche club or a team, but trust me, there's been a lot of people who have bought into them thoughts to actually make it happen and to get us where we are today. Can I ask you though, Sean, because to inherit a club like that is often on the back of somebody being dismissed beforehand. So how far away was the club from those values that you've just described when you first came in? Well, it was slightly different because Eddie had uh, been here and... And Jason and done a pretty good job overall. They were they were in a bit of a tough start to that particular season, but not um, n- not in trouble or anything. Um, I think when I, I got here, they were sixteenth, um, and they'd had a couple of losses. They on the pitch, they conceded a lot of goals. Eddie Eddie wanted a, a very open style of football, and they conceded a lot of goals. So that was easy, uh, not easy to stop. That what I mean is the easy message was: look, you all know we've got to stop conceding. So on the pitch, that was that. Cultural difference, different style uh, style of manager, um, coaching styles, you know, that sort of thing was different, of course. Not not right or wrong, by the way, because Eddie's gone under brilliantly. Um, He had his style, I've got mine. And more more about shifting the the culture then. So it wasn't a bad culture or a good culture, it was just shifting it to what we wanted. Um, And a lot of that came originally from feedback. I asked the players. I gave them a very simple questionnaire. I said, I want complete anonymity. I don't, you know, I'm not yeah. interested. If you want to write on it stupid words and draw funny pictures, which one player did, you're more than welcome to. If you want to answer it seriously, you're more than welcome to. If you want to be flippant, you can. Yeah. But I remind you of this. This is your chance to say everything you need to say about what's right and wrong about it currently and what you expect going forward. If you choose to throw away that chance, that's up to you. But I said, don't think there'll be another one in any time soon because once this is an agreed thing... Brilliant. But from buying from them as well, and yeah, I listened, yeah. 
So we got on with it like that. And, and then what's, I did what feedback back to, are on that questionnaire? Well, you know the hardest thing you'll do, you'll definitely know this is not loading them with the words in the question. So it's trying to keep the question so open that it doesn't guide you. Because I didn't want to guide them into the answer I wanted. I wanted them to be as honest as possible. Just really simple, well, trying to use simple wording like, um, what does the outside world think of you now? As a team, this is. What do you know? So they were in columns like team, individual, um, way forward or something like that. So the team one was like, what, do, what does the outside world think of you now? What do you want them to think of you? Say something like yeah. that. So trying to keep it as minimal words, but, but clear understanding. Um, individually, similar questions, you know. Uh, where do you want to go? You know, yeah. tell us where you want to go. So just leaving it as open as possible. And there was some really good stuff. There was some standard stuff, you know, what What's, I call... Can you, does anything still stand out to you from all that time ago? Yeah, I mean, well, you get the, the hardest thing in any feedback scenario is classroom answers, I call it. So, you know, there, there's the, the teacher at the front. You know, you think... They think, sorry, they want to give you the answer that you want. Yeah. And I was like, absolutely not. I tried to get them to say, I said, look, give me the answer you want. The, give me the answer you believe is correct. Don't give me the answer you think I want as the new manager because it's not going to get us anywhere. Um, there was things like they felt they were a bit soft as a team. They felt they were, could have been beaten too easily. There was, you know, so that's more team stuff. Um, there was things like, um, you know, the um, sharpness and fitness, but not... Uh, not being detrimental to Eddie, just a different style of fitness, like strength, fitness, you know, conditioning and stuff like that. So there's some physical stuff, which is, they're pretty standard, by yeah. the way. There was a few, you know, more de a bit more depth. There was a few saying, I want more from my career. I want to develop my career. You know, there was, uh, can, you, can you help that outcome? You know, mm -hmm. questions right. as well. Okay. So, yeah, so it was a mixed bag. Um, and I wasn't expecting anything profound, by the way. I was just expecting really to, first things first, let them know I'm here to listen. Yeah, I'm not here to tell you everything all the time. I will listen. Second thing is see who can just find that moment to give you the truth. Because like I say, someone classroom answers. And third thing, you know, you just get a feel of what's going on. Because even from that, you're looking at body language. You're looking at the words they use. You're looking at when they feed it back. So we, after that, we had an open feedback. So they, they yeah. fed it back to us. I made it clear that I've read them all. This is what came out. These were the things that came out the most often. And then we spoke to them about it. So then you get tonality, body language, you know, the, the, the meaning, the words they use. Is it them twisted words like positive negatives or negative positives? And you start learning about the group very quickly. And who emerged? So I can imagine in an exercise like that, that very quickly you'll see your leaders, your, your architects start to emerge when, when you do an exercise like that. How, how quickly did that happen for you? Well, I found that leadership's changing. You know, in, in back in my day when I was a player, you know, from so I played from '87 onwards. You know, that era uh, for 20 years, and I've seen leadership change radically in football. You know, the football leaders back then were usually vocal, um, consistent, um, not just in their messages and the way they played. Uh, they were pretty stand up. You know, they'd have a laugh, but they knew when to be serious. That type of leader. But leadership's changed now. You know. You started looking at, or well, the first kind of leadership shift I noticed was like David Beckham. You thought, well, Ian, he's definitely not going to be leading through his words and all that stuff, but he's going to be leading by the fact that put me on a football pitch and I'm going to give you everything and I'm going to do it with a bit of style and a bit of class and, you know, yeah. conviction. So, you know, you start opening your mind in when I was playing. I started thinking, well, there's more to this, you know, than just being a vocal leader. So I, I think it's changing. I think you, you're then watching the group, who's saying what, but also the, the, the depth of what they're saying. So, you know, there could be a true leader who's quieter, but he comes out with a really, you know, you think that's that's proper. That's someone who's thought about that. Someone yeah. who's delivering that with a bit of conviction. So I've had that as well, you know, a quiet leader. Yeah. So I think you're picking, you're picking, uh, trying to pick these golden nuggets out of these people, but all the time thinking group leadership is always better. If you can sure. get them to maximise their leadership potential as individuals in their own styles, and then usually the manager is kind of the leader of that, and then you get this collection of, not always um, obvious leaders, yeah. leaders of a different type, but I think we've tried to form that over time. So what do you do in that scenario where you want the David Beckham type character, the standout footballer, the maverick who comes in and makes a difference to your team, along with a group that you can still manage and mould in the way that you want your team, not just to operate on the field of play, but the way you want them to interact with each other? Well, the, the, so... Back to the start point, key core values. Whether you're good, bad, indifferent, whether you're the classiest player or not, you should be able to respond to a simple line of what we stand for. Um, 
After that, you're then looking at, you know, can they mould? Can they be a maverick, as you know? Not the, you know, terrorist types. You know, yep. you've got to get rid of your dressing room. You've got to get them out. Um, wrong word currently, but you understand my train yeah. of thought. Assassins. Um, yeah, assassins. You know, energizers. Uh, Clive Wilbur said energizers and sappers. Yep. So we, we bought a bit of that in. You know, we've got to remove the sappers. Give them a chance to realign. If they don't realign, you get removed. Um, but also there is a bit of flexibility within what we're talking about. I think if it's too hard and fast and it's the, my way or the highway, mm. that can equally lose belief in what it stands for. But they can't undermine your culture, though. Because as no. soon as one player does that, everyone else looks and goes, oh, Sean's a soft No, guy. but like I say, that's when the energizer and the sappers have come in. The, the, the biggest, the, the, when, you, when you know you're on something is when the group starts sorting it out. That's yeah. always when you know. When they start self-policing, you know you're on something. Now, that takes time to build that, of course. Because um, most f uh, footballers have a survival instinct, it's me first, you know. Yeah. Then beyond that, they start buying into the group. And then if you have success, of course, they start protecting the group. So, you know, you, you, you want to lead at first and you lay down a lot of things that you think are important. As it goes longer and longer, I do less of the leading and my staff take control and I summarise and, you know, look from a distance and, and join in and move in. Um, but that takes time to build that. So I think there's a, a number of different things that are important within it. Um, but I think... Feedback, I think, is important. Removing, uh, no, how can I say, realigning professional ego, I think, is important. Explain so, that. Well, so when we, when we were here, I made it clear, leave your ego at the drive. Well, you've just come down that drive. It's about a mile long for the listeners. It's about a mile long. I said, leave it at the gates. And I said, when you're in here, we're all the same. We remove our egos. We're all right. humble. We're all getting on with the work, and we're all working as hard as we can. When you go back to the gates, put your ego back on, do whatever you want, act how you want, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're in here... We build a one, mentor, a one team mentality and a one club mentality. Ways we did that, um, taking it away from people. Footballers, it's not an ego. Ego suggests sometimes it's a bad thing. You've got to have an ego to walk in front of 78,000 at Old Trafford. You've got to have a certain kind of ego. But there's got to be a humble side to that ego. You know? And so we had players who, we used to do dance-offs, sing-offs and everything. And it makes people uncomfortable. But once they realise, actually, these are laughing with me. They're not laughing at me. Yep. Then they, their ego comes off them and they go, do you know what? Yeah, fair play. You know, we had, well, I'm not going to say it's not fair, but we had one player who was, so now and again, we'd do a small side of game. If you lost, you had to do a dance off in the middle of a circle, all the lads clapping. I'm not kidding. One player, I swear, I don't think he lost for about 10 weeks and it finally came round. And at first you could see it, he was dying. Yeah. But afterwards, of course, the next time we come around, he's like, yeah, okay. So, you know, you're just, you're just stripping it back a little bit and going, look, we're all together. You know, you've got to go through the bad times, the good times together. And, and with that humble edge and that feeling that you, yeah, yeah. your mates are with you, you know, they're not there laughing at you. They're actually laughing with you. Now, that seems a weird thing and a simple thing, but it, I've seen it work right in front of my eyes. Sure. So, see, what I love about that, Sean, is that one of the things that I've seen with the best coaches is that they see every opportunity as coachable. So we were talking about a mutual friend of ours, uh, Tony Smith, where I remember that he used to stand at the uh, end of a canteen queue and see who were the players that just filled the plates up without any regard to the guys behind them and whether there was enough food for everybody. So he felt that that had given him an insight whether somebody was selfish or team-minded. Do you look for opportunities to reinforce yeah, I mean, the culture? In that well, way? that was you know back to the days when I was at Forest, Brian Clough. You know, honestly, if you didn't show good manners, he was on you. We right. do that here. Not because of Brian Clough, by the way, but things you remember when you grow you think, well, can you not just speak to someone in the right manner? What, where, where did that, that never go out of fashion in my world. Yeah. So therefore speak to people in the right manner. We travel clean as a group. We don't have one person with flip flops, one person with earphones on, one person with one arm, one sleeve turned up, one sleeve down and one leg up and one down and all that yeah. nonsense. We don't have that. They're the non-negotiables. The negotiables are wide and varied. The lads know that here. Can't name them all, but we we do days off. We listen. We you know. So there's, there's way less non-negotiables than there are negotiables. But certain things are important. How we look, how we conduct self, to me, are very important as a team. We get loads of good feedback here from travelling at airports and train station people writing emails. So by the way, your lads were terrific. They stood with my kids. Mm -hmm. We don't do the um, security. Virtually every single Premier League team now has some big security firms with them and teams. We don't do security. We just travel. Why is that? Because I think we, we, we're, we're a, a little club, and I'm not doing this down, but we're a little club, relatively speaking, in the Premier League. I don't remotely think we're a team of superstars. 
And I think that humble edge is important. It's important to our town. You know, there's a connection here with the players, the club and the team. It's not a corporate club, really. You know, there is a real connection. And I think them little things are important. Now, I must make it clear, I totally understand. I'm not judging. I've seen Man City. Their players are all world stars. They do need security sometimes. So let me make that clear. You know, I've heard stories when Man U are in the Far East and, you know, they go out of the hotel and there's like 10,000 people there. So they can't even just go for a walk. So let me make that clear. I do understand yeah. that. But while, we, while we're not that and while we can be open and control our situation, you know, in a good way, then we will. If a time comes when year on year this club is growing and putting more money in and signing superstars, then we would have to look at it. So I must make that clear. But at the moment, we don't need to do that. So we remain humble, we remain open. We speak to people in the right way. We treat people the right way. And I think that's still an important thing. So, so when you sorry, yeah, I was going to say. So, when you're looking to recruit somebody to come into the club, then these are all like very human characteristics that that uh, that you're looking for. How do you go about making sure that there is that right cultural fit that you're going to bring somebody in that that will observe these traditions? Well, the the you try and do as much background. There's a, there's a load of stories about you know because I've been here seven years and we don't spend a lot of money. Then it's like we won't sign foreign players and all this. It's a load of nonsense. I've said it in many interviews. We haven't got the depth that we need. This is not a club who want to sign foreign players who we don't know enough about for twenty million quid and sell them two years later for seven million quid. This club does not want to be doing that. This club is built on trying to buy players who we know but stuff about. We can develop them and one day they get sold. Or they're so good in them years that maybe they grow older being part of the club. So they've given you the money back in value, you know, for what they do and what they give. So that's that one out of the way. That's that one clear. Um, so beyond that, of course, it stands to reason. When you've been in the game as long as I have, then you know loads of people throughout the game. I know youth code. I know I've rang um, a couple of education officers. You know, to ask about the character of a player, to ask what they're like. I've rang youth coaches. I've, players I've known have been on the scene for 18, uh, since they're 18, sorry, playing in first teams. Well, I've gone back to when they're 18, spoke to the youth coaches to right. find out, you know. By the way, not about their ability. Who are they? Yeah. That's a really, really powerful thing, I believe. I believe, my belief is that. And I know, like you said, you've got to work with Mavericks and all that. Of course you have. But there's not a manager out there, you know, because I often, well, I'll give you an example. People say to me, oh, you always sign good characters. I said, show me a manager who doesn't want to sign good characters. I'm telling you, they all want to sign good characters. It's just that some are slightly flawed, but their skill set is so good, you'll put up with the flaws. And then I do remind them, everyone tells me about good characters. I said, well, I signed Joey Barton, you know. So was you, were you all thinking he was a good character? Because I guarantee you weren't. No, yeah. So, so yeah, they yeah. go, well, were they all good characters then? But I thought underneath all, he was the right character and a good character, um, which we found out he was. So, you know, there, there's a lot more to it. You can't just make out that every player has got the perfect attitude. They haven't. Once they're here, we try and mould them into what we've, first of what we've put here, and equally what we believe is important. Yeah. And do you buy into the adage that talent gets you into the room and your attitude keeps you in the room? It's not a bad shout. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, is it, is it the attitude that can build the talent? You know, so if there, there has to be a sign of talent, particularly if we're now aligning the Premier League, right? There has to be enough talent, of course. But can the talent be mould, sort of mould friendly, that the attitude will take the talent to another level? That's the deciding, that's really the bit that's really difficult to analyse. Are they good enough in the first place, but capped? Or are they slightly less good, but have growth? And that's the hardest thing to analyse, you know. Some people come out the blue and fly, some people plateau and some people actually drift and they can't quite find the moments that got them there in the first place. You know, when you sign a player and he might have been awesome yeah. and you get him in and they can't refind it. Yeah. So, you know, that's why it's so difficult signing players. It really is. Recruitment is difficult. Whether you've got loads of analysts, loads of teams of scouts or whatever you've got, it's still very, very difficult. And that's why you see some enormous sums paid for players who end up being all right. You know, they're not wonderful, they're all right because it's difficult. And how long would you... Would you give a player to, to, to come in and prove themselves? So if you were bringing somebody in and you felt they had the right attitude and they weren't quite, quite blossoming in terms of performance, how long would you... Yeah, we've had a few of them. We had James Tarkowski was like that. He had to sit tight while um, uh, Ben Mee and uh, Keno were doing great. Keno was another one. He played, uh, came in, played about 18 games in the Premier League, learned, didn't quite happen for him. Um, came back in the Championship, was awesome. Premier League, excellent, got sold for a fortune. We've had a number of them. Nick Pope, he had to sit tight uh, while Tommy Eaton was doing well. 
Um, he was learning in the background, as in Bailey now. Um, you know, they're learning in the background. And, and you see their attitude then. You see, are they sticking to task? Are they sticking with what the end product's going to be? Them players I've just mentioned, absolutely. 100%. Right. Saw it in my own eyes. You know, sticking in day in, day out. Attitude great, training hard. And then you think your day will come. It's, right. it's just like something about life, you know. They find a way. They just force their way through it just by being them and just by doing it right all of the time. Sure. And the ones that do that are the ones that usually get paid back. I don't mean pay as in money, but yeah, get paid sure. back with a chance or a break or something happens which rewards them. Well, Jake and I were talking about this in the car. We were talking about um, many years ago, I spoke to Alex Ferguson when uh, Danny Welbeck was coming through. And um, we were talking about his development and one of his things was the reason he persevered with him was that he was the kid that would always uh, go and collect the balls after training. And he said, and I always noted he went for the most difficult balls, the ones that were furthest away or the ones that were stuck up in a tree because he felt it told him something about his attitude, which would mean that he was prepared to be patient and persevere with him. Well, yeah, I mean, I understand he's trying to... He's, he's been brilliant with me. When I came up to the north, he, he stretched out to make sure he made contact and said, come and have a coffee with me, and I've kept in touch ever since. He's been brilliant. Not just me, by the way. A lot of young men... Well, slightly older manager, but young, young manager right. at the time. And, you know, he often explained things like that to me, you know. And, uh, but I remember that from Brian Clough back in the day. Like I said, good manners. He'd, he'd search for that, you know. You, and if, if you didn't, honestly, you would get it. You would. I'm not going to use the words, but you would get it in no uncertain terms. You know, your conduct around the place... Um, simple things, you know, like, you know, a cultural shift, it seems to me. A, a lot of kids now, they seem to be grumpy kids. It's like you pass them in the corridor and it's like, oh, all right. We just stop them and go, no, 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 no. You're a young professional footballer or you want to be. And you do that, do you? Absolutely. You just go, have, yeah. you ever th have you ever looked around? And Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you go, right, good morning, morning. <laughs> See, even though it seems crazy, but these little things eventually yeah. rub off, you know, and it's... You know yourself, your muscle memory, your actions, how you remember things, how you conduct yourself in future. They're all things that make a difference because not every player, you know, I'll give you an example. This is my belief. I've got, a, I've got children and I say I use a lot of this with them because I treat my players similar, really. Yeah. I say to my, you know, my kids, I go, look, there's that many kids, it seems to me, out there with that kind of attitude because I see them a lot. If you just do them basics, you look someone in the eyes, you shake their hand, you speak to them in a proper manner, that will get you started straight away. Straight away, yep. before you do anything in life, that will get you started. So these are simple life skills that they haven't always got or they haven't always been taught or they've lost the belief in them. Yep. The point of the story is that if you don't become a footballer, you'll stand out because of them things. You go into an interview and people go, God, I like the way they handle themselves. I like the way they conduct themselves. I like the way, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So we're always well. trying to reaffirm just good life skills. And by the way, do you know what's interesting? We've been talking for a while now. Have you noticed we haven't even gotten to 442 and 433 yeah, and all that? Exactly. Because there's so much more to it. Yeah, well, that is the case. What we've spoken often. a lot about, though, is you constantly improving your players, helping your players, sometimes changing your players. You've now been here for a number of years. What do you have to do about yourself to change and evolve so that they're not hearing the same message in the same way from the same guy every day? And eventually, they kind of are desensitised to it. It's really difficult. Um, as you know, I've got a certain sound, um, and it sounds negative a lot because of the, 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 the gruffness of my voice. So I tend to use probably about eight to one positives to negatives because my voice sounds like that anyway. So I'm quite self-aware. So you're aware of that, yeah? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So... Behind that, I go and I keep my mind open. I, I visit places um, when I can. And, you know, li lately it's been the rugby thing more because of the culture. Um, some will say because of the football. What do you like some about the rugby culture. culture? I just think that it's it's not where football is now, um, you know, financially. And, and that can change things. And it will do in rugby. Um, there's still that kind of inner core uh, belief in groups. And they're very, they have to be, by the nature of the game, they have to be extremely competitive and therefore they're extremely competitive in their groups, in their packs, if you like. But how do they keep the respect lines, even though they're cracking into each other every day, constantly? Yep. So things like that, you know, I like that. I like the, the training schedule, I like how they look after themselves. Loads of different things, you know, what they're thinking about culture, about environments and things like that. I went down to the Oxford Boat Crew, like, absolutely made Sean Bowden, they're still there. Um, I emailed him last year, I think he's still there, and he was terrific. Mm. I learned a what lot did you that. Take that was from my that? pro licence. Well, you got non-professionals who were the most professional people I've ever seen. I mean, a raw, super raw. They, they were in a gym, they just had a blackboard with literally the date and the time of the boat race, uh, boat race written on it. 
but a blackboard. Really? Not like some trendy, amazing yeah. Yeah. poster with lights around it, just a blackboard. And they walk over, they get their, uh, the, the row machines down, do it all themselves, get on the rowers, here we go, bang, start absolutely smashing it out. And you just think, that's a rawness. You know, there's a, there's a belief in that rawness that gives them that edge. You think football might have lost that a bit? It can, it's not, it's not that it's lost it. I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, you can't, you can't take it back there. Yeah. So you've, you've got a feel of our facilities here. You know, we were just talking about before we started this and you, you, you're not going to take them back to the scruffy gym that the boxer started in. You know, you're not going to do that. So, but it's making them aware that the, the reason why these things are here. Yeah. So it's not like a crutch to lean on. These are actually here for elite performance and therefore we've got to keep that mindset. And that sounds easy, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. Because it does soften your edge sometimes, you know, if all these things are so amazing that you end up doing not a lot yourself. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, it's a fine line to, for example, when we did the training ground, when we did it with the designers, we had a lot of input. They were great, the, the architects and the designers. And we said, look, it's got to be nice enough because their lives have moved forward, including our lives. You know, players here now are earning good money. They'd expect a certain level because they've grown into that. But it can't be so nice. It's not you know, like uh, gowns and slippers, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? I can assure you, you know, there's got to be an element where, no, no, it's a workplace, you know, yeah. and it, it means something. Yep. So uh, there's a fine line that, but that, that's to try and keep that, that little raw edge in the background, you know. So the, the good boxers never forget the first gym. The ones who maybe lose their way have probably forgotten that. I imagine, I don't like box, but you understand the train of thought. It's the old joke that we quote into that it's hard to run when you're wearing silk pyjamas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you, yeah, exactly, yeah. Element. Yeah. Good. Can I ask about these CPD visits that you've done to other environments? Because I see a lot of coaches go into different environments and then they'll often come back with a gimmick that they'll try and introduce. And it might last for a short period of time and then they'll forget it. So I hear a lot of coaches will say, uh, oh, we sweep the sheds. And then when you say, why do you do that? They say, well, I read that New Zealand rugby do that. And you say, well, I understand why they do it. but Yeah, but I think you... I, I've always thought... you. I try, I, I attempt, and my staff attempt to put things in place that are meaningful and they last. Right, and that was because, what I was going to ask. Yeah, like, it, like what's know, the most significant thing well, that's taken the other, away? The other big thing that I work with, including myself, is authenticity. Uh, authenticity sorry, you know, it's got to be authentic. Yeah. If, it, if it becomes like a, a silly throwaway thing yeah. that might have started seriously, it, it loses its edge. Sure. You know, so I think anything you put in has to be authentic. So the stuff that, and I also, I also believe that, you know, the best coach, the, be, the best thieves. So yep. you, you choose the things you're stealing, you know, and you choose the ones that you think will work in your environment. Um, and, you know, I've looked, I, I, I think that, don't get me wrong, I don't want to pontificate, there's others out there doing this sort of stuff, but I, I've been to KPMG, I've done a talk for them, but equally I'd fed feedback, you know, what, what, what do you think? What do you think of what I'm telling you? Yep. I did barred pharmaceuticals uh, this summer, and, you know, what, what did you think? What, do you tell, what, what, what was the things that you thought were interesting? What were the things that, do, yep. you, do you get what I mean? So all these, just on Virtue Motors last week, you know, and, but the point is not me always telling them. It's like, what comes back? What, what, what were you listening to out of that that made sense? Yeah. What, what had strength? What were you not so bothered about? What do you throw out of there and what do you keep? Because then you know, are you on something? Because if, if usually, if different areas of life think, I like that, you're usually not far wrong. Yeah. So what would you say has been the, the best idea that you've stolen from another culture that you've implemented with the best effect? Um, I don't know. Uh, let me... Th it's put me on my toes because I've, I've had that many influences. I, I played for 20 years. I had loads of different coaches, loads of different managers. I played all the different levels. Um, and then I coached through the system at Watford with A.D. Booth. So A.D. Booth, right? Sometimes gets some, not so much laterally. He's done great with the England setup, but, you know, got a bit of stick. He plays this way. But behind it, super organised, great with feedback, um, you know, good method to his thoughts on, on the planning, forgetting about styles and all that, on the planning, so nicked a lot of ideas about feedback structure. Right. The late Dick Bate unfortunately passed away, a big friend of mine and, and someone I bought here as a consultant. But, you know, been years as a coach. He's like a professor of coaching. So the use of PowerPoint, the use of language, the use of getting points across, the use of a mistake. He used to deliberately make a mistake so someone would correct him because now they'd remember the fact Brilliant. that they corrected him. You know, lovely, lovely little, little twi uh, yeah. twists and tweaks, you know. Um, Davy Dodds, who was with me at Watford, you know, working with young players, you know, done it for years and, and working to him, speaking to him, you know, in a certain manner and yeah. trying to get the best out of him. 
you know, John Duncan, who I played with at Chesterfield, maximising a group that were all right and turning them into a group that split up for millions of pounds at a club that never sold a player in 40 years or whatever, you know. So there's all these different influences, you know, and, and I've named a few, but there's loads, loads more than and that. Were you, you consciously know? absorbing these when you were a player? Do you know what I think? always have this plan. No, I think, I think you reflect on them more so later on in life. Yeah. I reflected on some of them. So when I got to, the first time I thought I was going to go into this side of it, was under John Duncan at Chesterfield. I started getting intrigued by, because we started having good success for a small club. And I started thinking, hang on, this is not by accident, this is by design. We're now, you know, we, we all couldn't stand him for the first year. I certainly couldn't. I tell him now, he's a good friend of mine. I, I use him now, I, I bounce things off him. Um, and then when we worked him out and he worked us out and then we built that trust and then we got on brilliantly. You know, and, and his planning and his organisation. And Kevin Randall, the late Kevin Randall, passed away, but he, I brought him here as well to work with me because I trusted him. And he, and he had, you know, great organisational skills. So things yeah. like that, you know. And he's not a massive name, but I tell you, he had it down. He just had it lock on lockdown, the organisational point of view. Things like that, you start using all these things, you know. And that's when I first started thinking... I'm having this, I like this. Then at Millwall, I worked with uh, Mark McGee, a really terrific young group of players. Richie Sadler, unfortunately, got injured. Joe Dolan, another one, got injured, but top young players. Um, Timmy Cale, of course, you'd know him, and Stephen Reid, and um, Paul Eiffel, and, you know, there were so many. Lucas Neal, these were yep. quality young players. Had a real edge to them, and I was the older pro, me and Stuart Nevercott, and these guys, and Steve Claridge come in for a bit. But you rub it, they're rubbing off on you and think, right, this is a good mix. Some old boys like me, keep it right, and these young whippets who are different class, you know. So, you know, you start reflecting on that and you start piecing these things together. I took me B licence, yep. got me A licence at the end of my career under Colin Cold, another one I thought was excellent. Right at the end of my career, really enjoyed him. Went on my A licence, got that done, and by the end of all that and all my thoughts, got the biggest twist of fate ever, went down to watch David Dodds work at Watford just to see him coach, Rematch A.D. Boothroyd, got rid of me as a player, sat on a bench, spoke to him about what we're speaking about now, my thoughts on it, got a phone call out, A.D. wants to bring you in. And he got rid of me as a player, but he liked what I said. What was it that said you it. said on that occasion that you What think? we're talking about, just that I finished playing, this is what I've learned. Yeah. So A.D., this is what I've learned. Right. And he's, he's a really receptive guy. I like A.D. a lot. I've got a lot of respect for him. He's a bright guy. And he, and he was listening. You know, he wasn't pretending listening. He was listening, listening. Yep. I didn't know that. He always said, he said, you've got, you got the best way of selling yourself without selling yourself. He said it was just authentic. He said, I just sat and thought, no, you're right. So he got me in and then you, you've got a chance then. And that sounds really similar. It wasn't similar. You know, under 18's jobs, you know, hard to come by. You know, so I was very lucky to get in with really good people straight away. And then you're off and running and then you're remoulding some of your thoughts, adding your own thoughts in and you're learning every day from the feedback from these young people who are trying to be footballers. I loved it. Absolutely loved the youth setup. Really did. So what's the thrill for you then? Is it three points on a Saturday? Is it learning about people? Is it improving people? Is it improving yourself? What's the, the thrill buzz? for me? I got in it to help others. I thought I had a decent career and I didn't think all of it was helped along the way. And I thought if I ever get a chance, the first port of call will be make you better than me or give you the chance, guide you to be better than me. That still really is the underbelly of what I do. The three points, you know, it's funny winning. True success, like say like, because, because staying in the Premier League is a different form of success, but say like when we won the league, right? When you win the league, that is, that is an awesome thing. That's like a season's work of true, unadulterated, find a way to win. Mm. It's the only way you can get promoted is to find a way. Can't always be sexy and lovely. Sometimes it's got to be grind. It's got to be powerful. You've got to do what you've got to do. And when you do that, that is a massive achievement. So don't get me wrong. I can, you can never take that way, that feeling, because that's unbelievable. But deep down behind that, why do I actually do it is really to give people a better chance than I had. That's, the, that's it. And when players come in here and they improve, some have moved on for multi-millions, some are still here doing great. That's what I really like. And do you know what? Sometimes if you can also help just add a bit to their lives as people, then even better. You know, that's really what I, I think well, is important. I think that's I probably a really, really healthy way to approach football management, isn't it? Rather than the kind of manager that lives or dies by three points on a Saturday. Well, I think the sign of any healthy culture is can you improve somebody from where they are, is, isn't it? That it doesn't matter. Whether... Well, I mean, I'm still learning, by the way. You know, I'm sharing with you the thoughts I've got from seven years here and a year at Watford and 20 years as a player. But it doesn't mean, by the way, I'm not, this is not all right. I'm not saying this is all right as in all fact. This is my thoughts on it. Yeah. You speak to another manager, it doesn't mean they're wrong. They might say, no, don't do any of that. I, I work with 4 3 3, and that's what they should be doing. And I'm not really bothered what they do off the pitch. That's up to them. That's maybe their style. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just giving you my view sure. of what I think is important. So 
When you look at the end of a season, how much difference do you make in points terms for you as a as a manager? What what difference do you think you make? I don't. I don't think. I don't really look at it like that. I think the group make a difference. I mean, last year was a perfect example of a group of people who turned a situation around. You know, we were in massive trouble at the halfway point. We had 12 points at 19 games. We'd just been stuffed by Everton. Loads of noise about it. Probably the first time in a long time I'd been heavily questioned, oh, you know, can we move forward? I must say the fans were great. I will say that because that's not easy for fans, but they, they stood, stood by me and what was going on um, when they could have down tools. But then you got a group of people that you could almost smell it where they went, right, enough's enough. And we turned it around. Talking they? about the players then? Yeah. Oh, well, and staff, and me included. Yeah. But a group, a connected group who possibly had been at stretch. The connections, the, the belief in what we'd done, the belief in what we do, had probably been at stretch, actually. Mm. Probably, not possibly, had been at stretch. To gather it back together and to make it go forward again. And not only go forward, we, we smashed the second half of the season, which yeah. is not easy. In relative terms, you, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? you know, outscoring some of the top guns and, you know, all that. That's actually my biggest success. So people think that my success here, you know, the promotion we got into Europe and all that. That's not in my view. That's not my biggest success as a manager. But I'm using my because I have to take the accolades or the stick. What I mean is our, really. Yeah. Um, and the players played a massive, massive part in that turnaround. So. What made the turnaround that season? What was the moment? A number of things. I think I, there's a thing that I believe in when you bottom out. There's a collective mentality where it bottoms out I believe and when did that when happen? it bottoms out after we got done by Evan you, know, you remember that, that feeling yeah well, you could yeah. sense it in the room it was like right enough's enough forget about what I did or said I think the groups went lads we're better than this right. we, you know we're, it's hard to explain it's like a collective you can almost smell it you know and you can, you can taste it in the room you think right you've bottomed out I could sense it so actually after that we, there was no slanging matches and all that it was very simply a meeting a powerpoint of probably about eight things that we'd forgotten. And I said, lads, this is what we're about. This is what we do. Can you remember what they were? I mean, just not off the top of my head, um, but, but j- basics. Yeah. Um, shape, alignment. Alignment was a big one. An aligned mentality. We all know what is needed, but we've chosen decisions to decide we don't need that. We've actually chosen right. as individuals to go, I don't think I need yeah. that anymore. Through what? Exhaustion? Lost. Thinking they no, know I better? Think, well, you get a little bit for the first time, don't forget, the season before you finish seventh. Yeah. And it's human nature to think, I think I've cracked this. Mm. It's human nature. Yeah, yeah. Now, we don't as staff, but not because we're mega intelligent, just because you're a bit older and wiser and you think, no, no, you've never cracked football. Trust me, you never cracked it. But when you're a bit younger and you've got a few quid and you've, you've had a bit of kudos because now you finish seventh and you're getting interviews and things that have never come your way yeah. before. Yep. And actually people go, no, do you know what? I think some of Bernie players are the real thing. I think they actually are that, whatever that is. And then all of a sudden, you've got this weird dynamic. And then you've got Europe, European football, which was odd and it's, it's you know very tiring, very hard, injuries, and all these different things start going. So if that happened again moment. and you finished sixth this season, for example. Resign. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> go to the beach. Apart from have resigning. Have a, have apart from resigning, go to the beach. Was there a learning for you that, right, I now know what i do if we finish sixth? Well, the, well Drag him in. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what on reflection that I was pleased with. Yeah. No panic. Yeah. There's no panic in the camp. No panic from me. No panic from the staff. No doubt. The players. There's always doubt. You can't, you don't, you don't, you don't get the elation of a win or the, or the, the, the feeling to push unless you have doubt. I don't think you have to have doubt. It's yep. just a human trait. Um, you know, all, all the things that we'd laid down backed up by years of doing it, backed up by no panic, backed up by clear alignment. This is what we need to do. That is what put all the noses back back in the right direction but the key was the acceptance of a group of people who said right we're with you mm. that's always the key you know because people go oh no I'm not believing that I ain't having it but the group went yep yeah, okay and we just you know realigned and delivered and the players delivered it wasn't me I can't deliver they delivered you know and, they, and honestly it's the biggest success I've had that's why I speak so enthusiastically about sure. it because it was hard and really not enjoyable at times but on reflection without doubt, the best management success, but put down to a group of people, not just me. It's just because I have to take the name of it because I'm, you know, I'm the manager. Sure. So how do you harness that to then replicate it again and again? Well, you, 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 gotta, you can always go back to it and go, hey, lads, remember. Staff, remember. And you do, you think, right, yeah. 
So you learn from that. You know how it felt, don't forget. You know that how, how, how wrong it felt to realign it to be right. So they're all things that do help. You know, you have to, you see old favourite, isn't it? You know, is it Jay Goovy? You, you never know. You don't appreciate the, the view from the top of the mountain unless you've been to the bottom of the valley. It's that kind of thinking. Yeah. You know, unless you've been down there, you don't really know how it feels, how it affects you, of course, because it does affect you, how you are, how you're dealing with it. Me as manager, my staff, the players, how are they actually dealing with it? Forget about whether you win or lose, how are they actually dealing with it in their own lives? You know, yeah. all them things become really important and they become really acute. You know, you become acutely aware of all these little things. Um, and to come through that, you know, you conduct it, you know, they conduct it, and it's always something to reflect on when, when needed. So if we had, we had a bad run this week, you know, three bad bad uh, losses, one not so bad, two mistakes, but the other two heavy losses. But if you get what I mean, because we've been down that road before, there's an alignment, lads, we need to do better, but there's not that kind of, oh, well, it's all wrong. There's no that thought. It's like, no, 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 we know what we're doing. So yeah. it's, it's now about delivering and delivering better. So who plays the part for you then, Sean, of being like – the voice on your shoulder, the, like the voice in your ear that sort of keeps you... Alive. Yeah, you've got your own self-talk, quite obviously, and I have plenty of that. I sit on the M6 for half my life. Yeah. Um, so there's plenty of that. You've got your staff, of course, and especially if you've got trusted staff. You know, I say, we have an agreement, tell me. Don't don't ever talk about that. Just tell me. Good news right. or bad news, just tell me. Um, so you've got that. You've got outside... Um, family in a different way. They more of a relax. It's not that they absorb. My missus don't know about football. She's not that bothered about football. She can ab absorb in a different way. She knows when to take my mind away from it and go right. We're going out with the kids. She knows I don't really want sympathy. Don't really like that. Yeah, um, bit of empathy now and again. A bit of like dad just needs an hour. You know, oh, yeah. his perspective outside the game from oh massive. Yeah, I mean, I, I use that a lot. You know, because football can be really intense and it can be really overbearing at times. I use that a lot. You know, I, I, I haven't lost. I mean, when I come out of Watford, for example, I got the sack there. And I said after that, they go, oh, you know, you must be this, must be that. I said, well, I said, people are a lot worse off than me, both career-wise and financially, who get the sack, you know, and they're in real trouble. I'm not in yeah. trouble. So I said, no, 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 I'm not going to start crying it in. You know, it happens. It's one of the challenges of the job that I'm in. Um, no, I use that a lot. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you see, I'll be careful what you wish for. I, I try not to cry it into it. But there's days when you get fed up, of course. And, you know, in balance that, you know, people sort of have this weird thing when they're always like, oh, well, it doesn't matter because you've got money or whatever. And you go, it's nothing to do with it. There's no relevance whatsoever whether you've got money or not at that moment when it's all feeling terrible. Yep. Um, but it is, a, it is a thing that you learn to deal with. But, but back to your point, outside of the world of football, I know there's a lot of people a lot worse off than me. So if my day comes, which it inevitably will do, either you leave for good reasons, you go on somewhere else, or you leave for bad reasons, you get the sack. Trust me, I'll be all right. I'm not. I'm not going to start crying over it. So again, a, a question that Jake and I were sort of reflecting on in terms of a lot of the stuff that we've read about you, and we know that the principles that you've introduced here at Burnley, how replicable do you think they would be outside of the world of football, whether it's that's to a different sport or some of these businesses you've been to speak to? Well, well, they seem to think the business I've spoken to, and I do quite a bit of that um, for a charity, actually. So when I do it, it all goes to a charity, the kidney charity that I support. Um, I do it for my development, because I think it's still important that you, different voices you're looking at, different faces, don't forget, uh, different voices you're listening to, sorry, different faces you look at. The feedback is different from the business world, of course. Um, and I think it's it's all part of, you know, you continue to improve, you know, and, and, and we were talking about earlier, CPD. Um and I forgot what your question was. So I was asking it answer. Transferable no. to the outside. Transferable. I mean, sorry, yeah. We've so, just so spoken, and we haven't key, really discussed football, have we, for the last yeah. hour? Key That's things, key sorry, thing. key things I was going to say. When you're talking culture, very transferable. Yeah. Most businesses I've spoken to really intrigued by how you align the culture. They've all got a good understanding of setting it and all the keywords and the buzzwords and different ways of setting it, but how do you actually bring it to life? How do you actually align people to believe in it? They're very interested in that. Because if you think about it as a crossover, that's not relevant like we are talking about now. It's not, it's not 442 or 433. It's just a crossover of life. They're very interested yeah. in that. Equally, I'm interested in how they do it. Um, so that's always one. Environment's very similar, but most companies, good companies, have got a good environment. You know, the obvious ones, people like talk about the the open mindness of Google, say, you know, yeah. they've got this amazing way of working. It's all very freelance-ish feeling, and yet you've got some of the top gurus in the world working there. You know, how do you, how do you align that when at first they're going, are oh, you kidding me? There's no structure to this. But in that world, lack of structure works. If you might be an accountancy, you might need structure, you yeah. know, so therefore it's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, 
a lot of the individual thing comes out. A lot of companies ask me, but how do you deal with the people? How you as people? Forget yeah. about the job they're doing. How do you deal with them as people? Because they always ask. Because obviously football's very stressful. So how are you dealing with them? Companies are, but what I mean is, it's internal stress. Football can be external stress. In fact, often is. It's fear of failure in front of mm. thousands, millions, you know, of people. When you're 19 years old. Yeah, and Twitter and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um, they're the usual things. They're the usual things. But but I like give my opinion, but I like it when they feed back. That's the point. I say, oh, we have this, you know, question, answer. I go, yeah. well, sometimes I ask them, I go, well, well you, you must have some of this. What, what, what do you think? You know what I mean? So I really enjoy that side of it. Brilliant. Really interesting. Right, before we finish, we've got some quick fire questions. Three non-negotiable behaviours that you and everyone around you have to buy into to be part of the journey here. Um, first, no nonsense in interviews as in cans and hats and one collar up and one collar down and trendy sleeve turned I'm up I'm amazed down that that bothers you so much how they dress because that's not going to win you three points is it? It's important to show the image of what the team stand for. Yeah. I think that's vitally important. I, I, well I was brought up in a different era as less you know, before I go on to your quick fire, because this ain't a quick fire answer. <laughs> I was wanting in I was born in an era when them things counted. If you're yeah. in a room and someone's talking, whether you like what they're talking about, you listen. You look at them and you listen. I was brought up with that way of thinking. I think that's still relevant. If there's millions of people watching my players on a screen, I expect them to respect the people through the screen. It might be old fashioned, but I'm not really bothered. It's a non negotiable. So don't wear cans. Don't wear you know, I saw someone do it's not fair to say I saw someone doing an interview the other day with you know the ear pods. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, are you kidding me? I'm telling you, if one of my players walked up to me, speaking to me with earpods in, I'd snatch him out of his ear and stamp him on the floor. I wouldn't really for all the <laughs> That would be going through my mind. I'd be like, are you, you're actually going to have a conversation with me with earpods in your ears. You haven't even thought I'd better take them out for it. That's not for yeah. me. That's just not for me. That just comes down to respect, though. That's not yeah, about, that's you know behavior, what I mean? That yeah. comes down to respect. Uh, sorry, next one. So respect, no number one. Is yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah no, it's a good way of putting it. So out of that story, respect, yeah. really, yeah. Um, I think professionalism, true professionalism, which means goods, bads, good form, bad form, uh, bad day at the office. We stick to certain levels of what we believe is right for the team as well. You know, like professional respect, if a different kind of respect, but professional respect. So self-respect is the first one. Professional respect would be the second. Lovely. And the third? Um, the manager's always right. No, definitely not. <laughs> the manager's not always right, although I never tell them that. <laughs> Um, Alex Ferguson actually told me a story about it. I said when was it you know when did you show when did you first say you were wrong and he said ooh I think it was about five and a half years and we won three titles I loved it I thought what an answer <laughs> that is <laughs> what an answer <laughs> that is um, do you know what a non-negotiable is a great attitude just just, just everything you do yeah. just be open minded work hard give everything you can in fact that's probably number one that's probably number one would be non-negotiable but I will educate that though because don't forget you don't know what you don't know so yeah. some people don't know what a great attitude is. They've never really felt it. So we will speak to players and remind and say, listen, these are the guidelines to help you find what that really is. Yeah. Because some don't actually know it. Some it's instinctive, you know, they built into them. Love it. Yeah. So what advice would you give to a teenage Sean starting out? Um oh, well, some some is not fair because of how modern Trends have changed. You know, so it's not fair to look back and start talking about diet and watching what you drink. I was just in a different era. You yeah. know? So taking them things out, I think um, absorb more from the coaching staff. I mean, not just listen, absorb it. Actually think it through. I think that's a big one. I think don't be, I was always the but guy. So you'd tell me something, I'd go, but, which we, as we know, negates what you've just said. So I was always, I'd go, right, shut your mouth, listen more, talk less. That'd be another thing, definite go. for me. It's a good one. Um, like more talk less. You know, because you, you know what I mean. So you say yeah. something, I go, yeah, but I was always that kid, so I definitely get rid of that. Um, yeah, th them two things would be a good start yeah. point. How did you react to your greatest failure or your biggest disappointment? I don't like the word failure because I think it's all learning, whichever way you look at it. Not sound nonsensical yeah. or silly about it, but I do. I but think failure is okay though. Should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Well, it happens. Yeah. It happens. Um, my biggest failure, to use that word, was at Bristol City. I moved down there um, for a few quid at the time, uh, like 375 grand, but that was first division to first division, so that was quite a lot. Uh, had a disaster off the pitch with injuries, had a disaster on the pitch when I played. 15,000 singing, we want Dai Chow, and I was captain. Not the highlight of my career. Yeah. But, and this is a good but to negate that, 
<laughs> that turned around my thinking of the truth of what it is. So now I don't fear that. If I get stick in the gut, it never really bothered me because I've had it. So I go, yeah, I actually, you know, the next day, you know, you get up and you live and you carry on. So yeah. I thought it doesn't really bother me. Um, I don't enjoy it, but it doesn't bother me. I learned about myself. I learned about the manager and the coaches, now they dealt with that moment. I learned about the club and how they dealt with it. I learned about fans, of course, the feedback from fans and how that changes. That period taught me more in my career and about me as well than I've ever learned in my life. So what came out of a really dire situation, because it felt dire at the time, trust me. My mum was there and she's crying. People are calling me the names we're not going to use now. Lots of people calling me them names. That hurts. Yeah. But I learned so much about myself and my career from that, then and on reflection. Got through it, moved on, and had more successes after that as a player than I did before it. So that was a key failure that actually ended up being the best failure I've ever had. Brilliant. Is legacy important to you? I think it is here, but I didn't come here to build a legacy. I came here because we wanted to try and add to what was already here and make it successful. Now it's become somewhat a legacy because of all what was this building, all the training ground and everything. So eventually it'll be looked at that it was under my remit, uh, not my remit, under my um, period that some of these things went on. As we've discussed, there's a lot more to it than just me. There's loads of people played massive parts in this. But I didn't come here to build a legacy or prove that I could build a legacy. I just came here to try and be successful. And with that has become attached to it like some form of a legacy. Okay. And finally, for the people listening to this, the one golden rule that you would either live by or would want to share with them for living a high-performance life? I think be honest. Be honest with yourself. Starts with yourself. Just, just tell yourself the truth. Take away the nonsense. Take away your ego sometimes. Just think, no, hang on a minute. Because your self-talk is really important. I'll be honest with others. You know, if, you, if you're going to deal with other people, which inevitably, if you're in my job, you are going to, Always rely on honesty as a great start point. You can, you can hard honesty or soft honesty, but just be honest. Oh, that's what I believe. Brilliant. Do you know what? That's been fascinating. We've sat here for all this time and not really spoken about football, but football is all we've spoken about at the same time. Interesting. Yeah, you'd it? only say 4-4-2, four, four, kick it forward. So don't worry, everyone says that. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's the football chat done. That's easy. Thank you for your time. Cheers. Thank you.